Thank you, uh, David and Carl, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to present to this uh, wonderful theoretical neuroscience seminar. Um, I have to admit from the start, this is actually the first time I talk about this work. Um, what I will discuss with you today is a, a theoretical framework uh, that we have developed for uh, Hebbian learning in networks of excited and inhibitory neurons that are recurrently connected. And I first want to give um, a big shout out to my student Samuel Ekman, who really led all of this work, so all of the theoretical calculations and the insights that we developed, as well as the simulations, were really developed and, and um, led by Sam. So thanks to Sam. And so I hope that I give justice in, in presenting this. So I'm going to start slowly and try to motivate for you, uh, first of all, why we're interested in um, understanding learning in networks. And, you know, especially in recent years with the development of all uh, deep learning and deep artificial neural networks, it is common for us to think that, um, you know, whenever we think of learning uh, in plasticity and sort of potentiation and depression of synaptic connections in network, uh, the question that comes to mind is, is how does this learning occur in these uh, deep artificial uh, neural networks? So here the idea, so these are networks that are optimized for the processing um, of particular tasks such as image recognition or image classification. So here the idea is that there's an image that is fed to these networks that are comprised of many, many different uh, layers. Uh, the, the signal is processed and then in the end comes out a label that basically puts this image in a particular class or category. What's become also prominent in recent years, uh, these networks are very uh, capable of, of performing really well in, in classifying uh, many different images. But what's become really obvious, especially with some experiments, uh, is the one I show you here from the lab of Jim DiCarlo at MIT, is that remarkably the activity that one can extract from these different layers in the hierarchy in these deep neural networks resembles the activity that one can record from different uh, stages of processing in um, in the brain. So in this case, in, in the, uh, the DiCarlo lab, uh, they recorded the activity in the visual system, in particular the ventral stream um, of processing in the monkey. And they effectively showed the same kind of stimuli uh, to these uh, brain networks that, that people usually show to these uh, uh, deep networks. So this is a class of images. And what they were able to find or characterize is uh, basically generate a prediction from different uh, layers in these deep neural network and compare that to uh, brain activity recorded at these different stages of processing in the ventral stream um, in the monkey. Then they computed a brain score. So this is what is shown here on the y-axis and, um, and effectively were able to, to uncover this remarkable relationship between this brain score and the performance of these different kinds of networks. So here in green are very famous networks that are used, such as, for instance, the AlexNet. And you see this remarkable correlation suggesting that, in fact, uh, these, these artificial neural networks really do almost as well as or resemble the activity of these of these uh, brain networks. But of course, you know, I'm not here to tell you um, how we can understand these deep neural networks. I'm interested in understanding how uh, brain networks, how neural networks process information and how they execute uh, different computations. And so we are now aware that there's indeed many differences between these deep neural networks and brain networks. And so one of these differences um, is, of course, the computations that they perform. So these deep neural networks are usually trained by backpropagation and they uh, can execute these, these tasks like image classification. What brain networks are really um, much better at doing is um, uh, basically generalizing. They can execute different tasks. And another, another big difference is, of course, that these real networks in the brain consists, first of all, of uh, far fewer layers than these artificial neural networks. In this case, let's say six starting from the retina, going all the way to IT cortex. And so one could potentially say that, well, maybe they compensate, they can execute as complicated tasks as image classification because they can compensate for the lack of this number of processing stages with, with recurrence. So what I want to convince you today is that this recurrence is, is really powerful it can, and can enable these networks to really do a diversity of computations that artificial neural networks cannot uh, do. So let's actually zoom in and, and start to appreciate this diversity that exists, uh, not just between um, these different processing layers in real brain networks, but also 
so within layers. So let's focus on one of these stages in this in this uh, uh, network of the ventral stream, and that is primary visual cortex that uh, many of us, I'm sure, have studied and are studying. So primary visual cortex we know is divided into these different layers. So there's already quite a bit of complexity and recurrent connectivity between neurons within a layer and also across layers. Um, and so this has been appreciated by many different studies, anatomical as well as physiological, that have really characterized the amount of complexity that exists, first of all, at the level of uh, connectivity. So here we can look at connectivity in cat primary visual cortex, and we can see that there is indeed quite a bit of recurrent connectivity. So in one of the, the layers that most of us study, for example, layer two, three, about 20% of the excitatory cells are recurrently connected uh, within this layer two, three. Um, another type of complexity that emerges is, of course, the diversity of cell types. Um, and so we can zoom in further and look at this layer two, three and propose uh, a microcircuit model that I would focus on today that is recurrently connected. So we have, um, uh, first of all, diverse cell types that are, of course, usually not there in these artificial neural networks. Um, for the sake of the talk today, I will divide these two classes in just um, excitatory and inhibitory neurons. But of course, we know that there's, for instance, multiple types of inhibitory interneurons. And even within the classes of inhibitory and excitatory neurons, we know that depending on different ion channel distributions and so on, these neurons individually sort of as, as single neurons, as single units of computation can really uh, do many, many different things. So we have this, um, we really have this, this idea um, that we want to understand how these brain networks, so these, these uh, neural networks work. We know that it's different in terms of what kind of connectivity they're comprised of compared to these deep neural networks, but they're also different in terms of the types of computations that they can perform. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, they can generalize, but in this context, I want to describe to you a particular computation um, that has been uh, studied a bit both experimentally and theoretically uh, by these type of recurrently connected microcircuit models, and there's this response normalization. So what is response to normalization? So to describe this type of computation, I'm going to refer primarily to neurons in layer two, three of the visual cortex. And I'm going to basically this, uh, start by describing a computation that we have known since Hubel and Wiesel that uh, these types of the, these neurons in the visual cortex can, uh, can compute, and that is orientation. So these neurons are orientation selective. So that means that if you show them stimuli that are oriented, for example, in the form of oriented gratings, that show, they show um, high responses to a particular orientation, and then uh, this response decays as you get away from that uh, preferred orientation. So in this case, of uh, these were experiments done in the labs of uh, Carandini and Harris. And the experimentalists apply, put this multi-electrode array on the surface of the cortex um, in the CAT, primary visual cortex, and effectively characterized the orientation map um, of these neurons that they recorded from uh, using these electrodes. So then they grouped all the neurons that they found to respond to a particular orientation and examined the responses as a function of two properties of the stimulus. One, as I mentioned, is orientation, and the other one is contrast. So um, as a baseline, uh, so this is the baseline that they used to normalize the responses in all of these cases, they uh, quantified the response to basically a blank screen, so stimulus that has neither orientation nor contrast. Um, and then they quantified the response of this population of neurons to two stimuli at 50% contracts that just differed in their orientation. So one grating, one stimulus that was horizontally oriented and another stimulus that was vertically oriented, shown here at the bottom. So you can see here that the responses actually show these nice unimodal curves that have a peak at the different preferred um, orientations. But what is interesting and what allows us to define this concept of response normalization is if we examine the response that was recorded by the authors in the case when these two stimuli, so these two gratings at these orthogonal uh, uh, orientations are actually superimposed. So in this case, the stimulus looks like this plaid uh, stimulus. And so what they were able to find is that the response of this population of neurons is not a simple summation of the two different uh, stimuli to the individual uh, gratings, but is actually a sublinear, uh, so it, it, it's, a, it's a sublinear uh, response. So the two are not added, but they're, the, the total amplitude is smaller than if these two stimuli uh, were added. <clears throat> 
And the situation becomes a little bit more complicated, of course, if now one changes the intensity of one of these gratings. So, for instance, if one of the stimuli, uh, in this case the horizontal grating, is presented at 25% contrast, um, and now looks, one looks at the, the combined response to this plaid grating, um, what one sees a bit surprisingly is that instead of these responses being added uh, linearly, one sees effectively a winner-take-all type competition. So the response to this weaker stimulus, this grating at 25% contrast, shown here, is actually suppressed. Uh, while the response to the stronger grating at 50% contrast is, um, is preserved. And it is not clear why, uh, a priori, why the neurons should actually show this response to this, to this combined stimulus when the, the two stimuli are um, unequal in amplitude. And so one, one thing one should consider is, for instance, if we were to implement a softmax operation in an artificial neural network, uh, one can quantify the difference between what the network actually responds to, which seems to be primarily the single grating shown at the top, or an alternative scenario, um, which has effectively the same distance from the actual stimulus as the stimulus on the top that is perceived. Um, so it's not clear why the top stimulus should be preferred. Why should the network respond primarily to the stronger stimulus and completely suppressed or almost completely suppress or ignore the weaker stimulus? So this is a computation. Uh, one computation that um, is interesting for us to study. And again, um, this is, I'm not going to propose a, complete, a novel model for how this computation can be implemented in a neural circuit, but I'm going to actually uh, call out on a very uh, now by now prominent model used in theoretical neuroscience to understand response normalization along with other computations such as surround suppression and so on. And that is the stabilized superlinear network or the SSN. So this network has received quite a bit of attention in the last uh, decade or so. It was proposed by, by Ken Miller, Yashar Ahmadi, and Ben Rubin, and, and, and others. Um, and it allows us to effectively really appreciate the power of, of recurrent connectivity. And so here we have a network of recurrently connected excitatory inhibitory neurons, shown here with triangles and circles in the different colors. And one characteristic feature of this network, besides this recurrent connectivity, is the superlinear activation function. So what does that mean? So that means that each of these individual units that make up the network um, can describe its output, for example, its firing rate, in a way uh, that is, is a nonlinear or superlinear activation function that takes the shape of a power law. So if one can think of here this the input being, say, the membrane potential of the neuron and the output is being the firing rate of the neuron. And there's, of course, experimental evidence that neurons in the primary visual cortex have these power law-like input-output functions. And this model, um, so this, this particular feature of the, of the SSN, namely the presence of this power law uh, nonlinearity, actually can embody the network with quite important um, dynamical effects. So despite the presence of this power law nonlinearity, stability in the network can be maintained in the dynamical fashion via feedback inhibition. So one can understand this by effectively considering changing the input strength in the system. So at low input strength here, uh, the gains in the, in the network are low. And so basically the drive within the network is weak. And so what this means is that the um, responses sum supralinearly. But as soon as one transitions into this regime, when the input strength grows, where um, effectively the gain increases, to, to stabilize the network requires very strong damping, which is provided by, by inhibition. So we, get, we enter a regime where inhibition ends up stabilizing uh, the network. And so this has interesting dynamical effects that I'm not going to discuss today. For instance, the presence of a paradoxical effect and so on. And this enables um, the network to generate this property of response normalization, where the responses sum sublinearly that I described on the previous slide. So um, what does this network look like? So in addition to this recurrent connectivity that I illustrated here, there's of course uh, feed forward inputs. And so in this case, we assume that um, if we focus on an individual unit or module in this network that's comprised of one excited and one inhibitory unit, we can think of, we can uh, quantify uh, the feed forward input that is received by each of these two cells with these uh, tuned tuning curves 
that have the shape of these Gaussian bumps. So basically each of these units, EI units in the network is assumed to have a preferred orientation tuning. So if we pick this particular unit that is tuned, for example, at 40 degrees, then one can measure uh, basically the total input that is received by these two cells by effectively reading out on the y-axis uh, the amount of input that's received by, by the two cells. And so when we combine uh, this feedforward input, which of course is there for all the neurons, not just for the one at 40 degrees uh, that I tuned at 40 degrees that I picked out, uh, we can combine, if one combines this feedforward input along with the recurrent connectivity, one can effectively generate or report the uh, firing rate of each of these excitatory units in this, um, in this network. And so this is given here by the tuning curve. And so let me just show you that indeed this network can capture this response normalization that I motivated for you a few slides ago. So if we show these stimuli 1 and stimulus 2 that are presented at basically the same relative strength, for instance, the, the contrast of the grating in the, in the experiment I showed earlier, and then one shows the two stimuli together in the form of this plat uh, stimulus, you see that the responses are summed sublinearly. And then, but it, then if one changes the relative amplitude of, say, stimulus 2, one can see again this winner-take-all type competition where the stronger stimulus is uh, preserved, but the weaker stimulus is suppressed in this, in this winner-take-all uh, uh, manner. All right, so this is all wonderful, uh, and we have learned so much about how this network processes information from, from papers that have come out in the, in the last uh, decade and, and the types of computations that this network can actually implement. But one of the big caveats and drawbacks is that the connectivity that is assumed, although inspired by experimental data, is all hardwired. And we're interested in how networks come about to develop this time, type of connectivity. So how do they use um, biologically plausible plasticity rules to effectively change the strength of the connection so that they can evolve into some state that's, that's uh, stable, um, so that they can execute these interesting computations such as response normalization that is present in the SSN. So effectively, the task that um, we sought out to achieve together with Sam that I'll, that I'll show you today was a, a project, a framework for how we can learn the recurrent connections in the SSN so that it can implement these interesting computations that typical deep neural networks cannot uh, achieve. Okay, so as a first step, um, this is going to be, uh, you know, I'm 15 minutes in, but I want to build this from the ground up. So I'm first going to start with very, very simple circuits that don't have recurrence, and they actually only have a single neuron that receives input from, from multiple input neurons. So I'm going to focus on one of these units, these excitatory inhibitory units, and even more, I'm going to focus on the input that is uh, received by a single excitatory neuron in the cortex, and then I'm going to build that up to a feedforward network, and eventually I'm going to add the recurrence. So to think about what type of input this excitatory neuron receives. We know from a lot of experimental literature in the past few decades, um, we know that there's a balance of um, excitation and inhibition in terms of the input that such a neuron would receive in the cortex. Here we have an example of activity that was recorded during spontaneous activity um, in uh, somatosensory cortex. So one can look at the postsynaptic potentials, excitatory inhibitory, and see that they're very well matched. So every time there's a big influx in excitatory, it is matched by a big influx in inhibitory uh, uh, drive current. And the same thing applies when one looks at um, the, this, these, the synaptic conductance input um, in the case of evoked activity. So instance, this is in the auditory cortex, and these are tones, uh, frequencies of uh, 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 tone frequencies is the stimulus here. So there is this balance of excited tuning inhibitory tuning that's been seen in different types of sensory cortices across the species, but uh, although there's models and propositions for how this could emerge, even at sort of the feed forward level and at the level of a single postsynaptic neuron, we still don't have a firm grasp. So let me first start by, by building, a, a building up the framework by understanding how this particular balance can emerge in these circuits. So we're going to use a very classical biologically plausible learning rule, and that is Hebbian learning. Um, what Hebb proposed already in 49 was that when the presynaptic neuron drives persistently the firing of the postsynaptic neuron, then the synaptic strength is potentiated. So we can 
formalize the differential equation where the change in the synaptic weight is just proportional to the product of the pre and the postsynaptic activity. So when the pre neuron drives the post neuron, the synaptic connection is potentiated. Now, this is biologically plausible and there's multiple evidence of, of that this rule is really there, um, but it also has advantages. For example, it can be implemented in neuromorphic hardware. But it has one problem, and that is the problem of uh, positive feedback, um, uh, basically positive feedback processes. So every time you, you drive, you persistently drive the postsynaptic neuron, of course, its activity increases, which causes further potentiation of the synaptic weight and so on. So you have you don't have a way to control the weights in the system. And of course, this is this is made further problematic by the addition of recurrent connectivity. So there are, of course, ways to resolve this. Um, but let's first begin formalizing mathematically the problem. So as I said, we're going to start simple. We're going to start with a single postsynaptic neuron uh, Z uh, that basically is um, a linear function of um, the inputs here given by the vector y through the weight vector w. So we just have a linear function. Of course, I'm going to show you nonlinear examples uh, later on because we're after uh, learning the SSN. But for now, bear with me, we have a linear system. This has been studied by many others in the past. So we can write the weight dynamics by basically writing the, the Hebbian rule. So we have effectively a covariance matrix here and the weight vector. And this is nice because we can really solve what what, what goes on here, we can solve the dynamics of this weight vector by effectively doing an eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition of the covariance matrix C. Should note here, uh, the angle brackets are used to denote ensemble averages, so basically average over multiple presentations of a stimulus from a given distribution. So what does this mean? So this means that effectively the weight vector in this case will grow unbounded and it will grow unbounded in the direction of the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix C. And effectively, the amplitude of the growth is determined by the strength of the corresponding eigenvalues. So we can actually visualize this in the cloud of, of input data points. Here, here the gr uh, green arrows denote the uh, two principal components, so the eigenvectors of this uh, covariance matrix. And so we see that the, eigen, uh, the, the weight vector here would actually go in the direction, uh, would grow in the direction of these two um, eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. OK, but as we said, this rule is unstable. So how can we basically stabilize the synaptic weights? Um, so again, this was uh, proposed by uh, by some people here. We have uh, Mackay and Miller and, and Oya many, many years ago in this simple framework. But I just want to mention that now, actually, years after it was proposed uh, theoretically, um, there's also a lot of experimental evidence that this is indeed th what happens. So there's basically limited um, synaptic resources, and the synapses effectively compete for these limited synaptic resources. Um, and so this is an experiment done in the hippocampus where LTP was invoked by theta burst stimulation and the experimentalists basically measured the strength of these synapses before and after LTP induction. And they found that, of course, after LTP induction, the synapses were potentiated. But the key finding was the total synaptic area um, after LTP induction was preserved relative to that prior to LTP induction. And so one can formalize this, of course, with this normalization constraint where the sum of the weights is preserved to, um, to be equal to this constant. There's different ways to, to uh, implement this. One way is to do this to now modify the equation, the covariance equation for the weight dynamics by doing subtraction, by basically subtracting a, a component proportional to the weight vector. And what's really nice is that now we can really solve this dynamical system. We can find the fixed points of the dynamical system, which basically are the, the um, eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. So effectively, we're doing principal component analysis because now, if we look at the cloud of data points, we see that the weight vector actually aligns with the largest principal component in the network. So this is all fine. Now, I haven't shown you anything new. I'm just putting everything in the framework uh, where I'm going to go and expand this to the recurrent circuit. But before I go to the recurrent circuit, um, let me just point out that these same experiments identify that this competition for limited synaptic resources and this type of normalization is also found for inhibitory synapses. And so what we did was we just extended this framework, first of all, in this feedforward setup by introducing inhibitory weights uh, that basically receive uh, input from this new inhibitory input vector, yi, um, through 
um, this, this weight vector WI. And so now we impose a secondary normalization constraint for these inhibitory feedforward weights to the postsynaptic neuron uh, Z. So we have two constraints, one for the excitatory, one for the inhibitory neurons. Now the modified weight dynamics has an additional subtractive term for these um, inhibitory weights. And now we have a slightly different matrix. It's not a true covariance matrix, so we call it a pseudo covariance matrix. But again, we can find the fixed points of this covariance matrix, and they are again the eigenvectors of the, uh, we can find the fixed points of the dynamical system, which are the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. So our conclusion is that um, we, if we develop this framework, we find that the fixed points of the dynamical system, which tell us what the weight dynamics will eventually settle to, are the, the, the largest eigenvectors, so the principal eigenvectors of this covariance or pseudo-covariance uh, matrix, uh, uh, matrix. So what does this really mean? So let's actually uh, think about what this means in the context of this balance of excitation inhibition tuning that I mentioned at the beginning. So for this, we're going to make a simplifying assumption, and that is we're going to assume that these excitatory inhibitory um, inputs to the postsynaptic cell, so this YE and YI, are equal. And you know, the motivation for this assumption is that, uh, for example, in the auditory cortex of the cat, the tuning of excitatory inhibitory neurons has been, has been found to be very similar um, in terms of in sharpness, in, in broadness. So if we make this assumption, this pseudo-covariance matrix that plays a key role in the weight dynamics takes a very uh, relatively simple form. And so we can now again find uh, the, the steady state, the fixed point of the weight dynamics, which now has two components, one that corresponds to the excitatory weights and one that corresponds to the inhibitory weights that actually just have a simple sign flip um, um, uh, in this case. So what really happens if we look at what this excitatory inhibitory component of the weight vector, this V and minus V, look like, is they basically are in exactly aligned along the principal um, eigenvector of the covariance matrix, but they're opposite in direction. So we're still doing PCA effectively for the excitatory component of the weight vector, and the inhibitory component lines up in the opposite direction to the excitatory one. So this is interesting for us because, of course, we can do all the theory in the linear case, but we can also simulate a nonlinear scenario. So here we have nonlinear neurons and a more complex input space that consists of these tuned, um, of these tuning curves. And what we see is actually that, you know, when we have this feedforward plasticity in the simplified feedforward uh, system, we see that this beautiful tuning for excitation and inhibition develops. So effectively, we have uh, this balance of excitation inhibition that I motivated for you um, at, at the beginning. And I should point out that um, we have achieved this with this Hebbian rule plus this subtractive normalization for the inhibitory weights that was in addition to the excitatory normalization. And this was not, cannot be achieved, um, it has not been achieved previously with other inhibitory plasticity rules. For example, the fogels sprechler uh, rule that, that many have used before. So, okay, but ultimately we are after understanding plasticity in a recurrent circuit. So what can we do? How can we, what can we build on? How can we extend this, this relatively simplified feedforward circuit with a single postsynaptic neuron to, to ultimately understand fully recurrent plastic networks? So what we're going to do, the first step that, that we're going to implement is we're going to add additional lateral input. In this case, it's an excitatory neuron in this light blue. This excitatory neuron is not plastic, meaning that these weights that it receives from the input space are static. This synaptic connection is plastic between the excitatory neurons. But this, we're going to assume that this additional lateral excitatory input is tuned to an eigenvector of the feedforward covariance matrix of these inputs uh, Y. And so now we're going to ask uh, how in the learning rule that we propose with the normalization, how this, this learning is affected of the feedforward weights, so here shown in black, how this is affected by the addition of this static lateral excitatory input. So essentially, by adding this lateral input, what we are achieving is we're increasing the dimension um, of the input space uh, by the output of this light blue neuron, which is effectively given by the dot product of the weight vector P and the input Y.
So now we can calculate the new covariance matrix that we call C bar. And again, we can uh, decompose, we can find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this new covariance matrix. And what we find now is that the, the attraction or the growth that occurs along the, the eigenvector of the covariance matrix um, to which this additional lateral input is tuned to becomes increased by effectively the variance that is introduced by uh, the addition of this new lateral input. So what does this mean? So um, if we now consider this uh, cloud of data points that we had originally in, in the black uh, that, we, that we had as Y, and if we now effectively change uh, the norm of the uh, feed forward, uh, if, if we change the norm of the feed forward input to the additional neuron that we have added, we can see that we can effectively transform the input space um, so that when we perform PCA, the data is effectively stretched. So here we're, by effectively uh, changing, changing the, this, this eigenvalue, we're effectively changing the attraction landscape of the feedforward input um, when we've added this lateral additional input relative to the original one where we didn't have this lateral input. And we can also capture this effect in um, a nonlinear network that has this more realistic uh, tuned input. So in this case, we introduce, uh, we have this additional lateral excitatory input that is static. So this is what its uh, tuning curves look like. So this is this weight vector P. So this is static. And we initialize the feed forward weights from the inputs Y to this postsynaptic neuron here in black to be completely random. And then we see if we run the plasticity in this network, we see that indeed the attraction of this particular uh, uh, mode that is characterized by this lateral input of this eigenvector basically um, increases. And therefore, all of the weights of this, of this neuron now, the feed forward weights become attracted to it. So we effectively have collapse or um, um, convergence of these tuning curves. Okay, and we can also now consider an alternative scenario where instead of an additional excitatory neuron, we add an additional lateral input that is an inhibitory neuron. But now, so now the same thing happens um, with the exception that now uh, when we calculate the eigenvalue of this, this eigenvector to which the lateral input is tuned to, ends up decreasing in, att in, in attractiveness. And so we can again visualize this. So when we change the norm of this feed forward input uh, uh, vector, we see that now instead of stretching the data, which is what we achieved when the lateral input was excited to now the data is, is compressed. And we can again visualize what happens when we have a fully nonlinear network with these, uh, this more interesting input space in the form of these, these Gaussian-like uh, tuning curves. So in this case, we don't just have a single excited to neuron as we did here. Here we have multiple inhibitory neurons, uh, a bit different than what is shown in the schematic. And what we do is we actually initially distribute uh, the tuning curves of these inhibitory neurons. They're all static, but we distribute them um, almost uniformly in the input space with the exception of this gap that's indicated here by, by the little arrow. And then what we see, because now the attractiveness of each of these tuning curves is decreased, um, this, this uh, plastic excitatory cell actually becomes selective for the gap. So this is actually the place in the input space that's basically least attractive, sorry, least repulsive uh, to, the, to this neuron. And so that's the one that doesn't become suppressed and that's ultimately the one that the neuron selects. So let me, let me show you this. And so indeed we see that uh, that's what happens. So the tuning curve that this plastic neuron develops is one that, that basically fills in the gap because it's effectively repulsed from every other tuning curve. Okay, so this um, this is this is great, but again, it's just a step in the in the full in the full framework. So what we can do is we can combine the results that we have when we add this additional excitatory or this additional inhibitory lateral input, and we can effectively uh, conclude that um, the total attraction of a particular uh, the total attraction of the eigenvector of the additional lateral input that is being added that is provided, that is given by this eigenvalue, uh, lambda total, is um, a combination of three terms. First, we have a combination, a feed forward uh, component, a sigma lambda, uh, of when we just have the, the input space Y. Then we have a lateral component uh, provided by the addition of excitatory 
uh, cells, which increase the attraction of, this, uh, of the eigenvectors by increasing the eigenvalue. And then we have um, inhibitory cells, which decrease the uh, attraction of this particular eigenvector to which these lateral inputs are attracted to. OK, so the, this additional lateral input that we introduce can either increase or decrease the total attraction along uh, the tuning direction of, of the eigenvector to which these inputs are tuned to. So um, this is um, fine, but now let's build the circuit further. So let's go beyond just introducing these, uh, these lateral inputs uh, uh, one by one. And let's consider a network where we have, for example, two excited tree connections uh, that are recurrently plastic. And, and let's assume for now, um, for now I'm not going to show you the recurrent connectivity, but I'm just going to show you the feed forward weights. So each of these tuning curves basically corresponds to the feed forward input vectors for these two cells uh, as they're connected to the input space. So, uh, but they are recurrently connected and they are plastic. So because these tuning curves overlap somewhat, um, the firing of the cells is correlated. And so as a result of the heavy plasticity that we have, um, the recurrent connections between these two cells will increase. And based on, the, based on the framework that we developed before, we know now that the attractiveness of the, the, um, this eigenvector to which these cells are tuned to will increase. And so they will effectively cause the two tuning curves to merge or to collapse onto each other. And that's indeed what happens. So we simulate this now nonlinear system and we see that because of the slight overlap that exists at the beginning, the heavy plasticity will effectively make them merge uh, with each other because we have this increase in attraction of the corresponding um, eigenvectors. And if we now um, do the equivalent scenario where we have two inhibitory neurons that are again recurrently connected, and if we now show again the feed forward uh, weights, so in this case, what we see um, is that the tuning curves will end up uh, pushing each other. So we have repulsion. And so the cells, the cells tuning curves end up basically distributing themselves in the entire input space. So we have the correlation that is provided because of this recurrent inhibitory connectivity. So the question that arises here is, how can we combine these two results? In other words, can we somehow use this result that we have from, these, from this decorrelation for the recurrently connected uh, purely inhibitory circuit to actually prevent the tuning curves of the excitatory cells from collapsing? Because obviously, you know, you might imagine we don't want a scenario where every single, and that's not what we have in biology, where every single excitatory neuron in the cortex is basically tuned to the same orientation. They're tuned to, to a range of orientations. And so we can actually use um, this property of decorrelation by the inhibitory circuit to effectively push or prevent these tuning curves from collapsing, so to push them apart. So the basic idea is that we can do this, uh, is that the increase of attraction that is introduced by an additional lateral excited neuron has to be balanced by a simultaneous decrease, decrease in attraction, or rather increase in repulsion that is achieved by the addition of an inhibitory neuron. So, so we have a way to sort of combine um, uh, how excitatory and inhibitory neurons um, contribute to uh, plasticity via this increase or decrease in attraction of a, uh, to a corresponding eigenvector in the input space. But we can take this analogy further and we can actually now study a fully recurrent circuit uh, that is plastic. So here we have a circuit comprised of these excited and inhibitor neurons. They receive feedforward forward input and they are all recurrently connected to each other. So we can actually use this intuition that we developed uh, for the feed forward system where we added a single lateral input tuned to a particular um, eigenvector of, of the input and actually replace this single neuron with a whole circuit that's comprised of different excited tuning inhibitor neurons that are all recurrently connected. And we call this an eigen circuit because we assume that all the neurons in this eigen circuit are going to be tuned to the same eigenvector of the feed forward covariance matrix. So instead of having a single cell that is tuned to a particular eigenvector of the feed forward covariance matrix, we now have an entire recurrently connected circuit that we call an eigen circuit. And this is very difficult to study in the very general sense. So let's assume that we have a scenario, a local scenario, where the circuit is stable. 
Um, so we have a local equilibrium, in which case the, we expect that the local weight change for each of the neurons has to be zero. So in this local equilibrium, we can calculate the attraction of this eigencircuit by effectively computing the contribution of each of the excited tune inhibitory neurons in the circuit uh, to uh, the eigenvalue of the, of the eigenvector to which the eigencircuit is uh, tuned to. So as before, uh, this eigenvalue has three parts that contribute to it and therefore change the attractiveness of this eigencircuit. First, we have a baseline term. This is simply the what we call the, the baseline feedforward attraction um, of the eigenvector that's purely determined by the, uh, by the properties of the input. But then we have modifications that are due to the excitatory and the inhibitory neurons. So the excitatory neurons are the ones that increase the attractiveness and the inhibitory ones are the ones um, that decrease the attractiveness of this eigenvector to which the eigencircuit is tuned to. This is just like what we had before when we had a single neuron. But the difference now is that these contributions, these variance contributions, these sigmas, are now actually uh, dependent on several things. They're dependent on the numbers of excitatory and inhibitory neurons in the eigencircuit, because we no longer just have one neuron. And they also depend on the weight norms. Remember, we have Hebbian plasticity plus normalization. And in this case, remember that what we're constraining is the total sum of the weights. We have two types of neurons, and so therefore we're, we have um, uh, four types of normalization. So we can, uh, WEE is the total, uh, the, 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 the constant to which the total sum of all excitatory weights onto an excitatory neuron is constrained to. WEI is the constant to which the sum of all ex, um, excitatory weights, sorry, inhibitory weights onto an excitatory neuron is constrained to, and so on. So effectively, the attraction of this eigencircuit now in this local equilibrium is a combination of uh, the attractiveness of the, the baseline input and these terms that involve the numbers of neurons, excited tune inhibitory, and these norms for the weight normalization. So this is really important because this, as I'll show you in a moment, allows us to basically derive conditions for when and, and for when we can derive stability in the system and what type of stability uh, this is. Okay, so uh, we can assume that in this in this framework where we think about local stability and local equilibria, um, we can basically partition our network into multiple eigencircuits, which are indicated here by the different colors. And we basically do this partitioning, we basically divide up this network into multiple eigencircuits, um, effectively by assuming that cells in each eigencircuit are tuned, excuse me, uh, cells in each eigencircuit are effectively tuned to um, the same within the eigencircuit, but the same eigenvector of the covariance input matrix for within the eigencircuit, but different from the other eigencircuits. So, for example, these light blue cells are tuned to one um, eigenvector, uh, these purple ones to a different eigenvector, and so on. Now, because we know that the eigenvectors are orthogonal, the activity of these neurons uh, that belong in these different eigencircuits will effectively be uncorrelated. And so this means that we can effectively ignore, we can assume that the recurrent connections between these different eigencircuits are very weak. So uh, let's assume again that the system is in a local equilibrium where we have these effectively uncoupled eigencircuits. According to what I showed you here on the right hand side, we can write the attraction of each of these eigencircuits in this local equilibrium. So each of these eigencircuits can either be attractive or repulsive. And as I said to you, that is determined by how many neurons you have, excited and inhibitory, what are the weight norms, um, and so on. So in a very simple manner, you could think that maybe the excitatory neurons in a given eigencircuit basically contribute plus one to the attractiveness of that eigencircuit and the inhibitory neurons contribute minus one. So in, in a very simple way.
So we can let's let's proceed with this with this uh, thought uh, example with this toy example here with this thought process, and for each of these um, four eigencircuits in this example, let's actually plot what this attraction um, would be in this local equilibrium. So let's assume that three of them, eigencircuits one, two, and four, are all repulsive, and eigencircuit three is attractive. But because we're only in a local equilibrium, this is, of course, this configuration is not globally stable. In fact, uh, because we have different numbers of neurons in each of these eigencircuits, it turns out that this highly attractive eigencircuit attracts all the neurons from the others, uh, from the other eigencircuits that are actually uh, repulsive. So they become attracted to this eigencircuit 3. And what that means is that we effectively get a collapse of the tuning curves where we now have um, where we're now this highly attractive uh, circuit, eigencircuit 3, became uh, repulsive. And the reason for this is that one can think of that, that in, these, in this toy example, we had only one excitatory neuron that basically increased the attraction, but we had two inhibitory neurons that decreased the attraction. And so overall, we had a global decrease in the attraction of this eigencircuit 3. But just like I said to you before, this process can continue. This is only a local equilibrium. And so we can push the procedure further. And, and But now we have a configuration where most of the tuning curves are collapsed with the exception of this one, which is, uh, which is repulsive. And based on the intuition that we developed from the circuit where we only had it basically inhibitory neurons, uh, this would mean that the neurons would effectively be pushed away from this eigencircuit and be effectively distributed uh, through input space because we basically um, will have a total amount of uh, net attraction, net decrease in attraction or an increase um, in repulsion. And so in general, we conclude, if we iterate this process further and further, we conclude that we can prevent this collapse of these uh, tuning curves for each excitatory neuron. If we, for every excitatory neuron that we have, we have sufficiently many, and we can calculate exactly how many inhibitory neurons that is, that become attracted to uh, the dominant eigencircuit. So we can derive a mathematical condition that basically tells us what the total change of attraction would be for an eigencircuit, and that one has to be negative. For every excited, for for every one change in in excitatory neurons, um, where the the fraction of inhibitory neurons is given is given by by this ratio. So although I've developed this framework for just linear neurons and talked about local equilibria, this very much applies to a fully recurrent nonlinear network, where again we have this. Uh, um, plasticity of both feed forward and recurrent connections. So I, I hope that at least this framework of the eigencircuit analysis can kind of guide you towards thinking of what really goes on. So let me show you what really happens in a fully recurrent nonlinear network. So here we're, this is what the network would look like. So we have multiple excitatory inhibitor neurons that, that are recurrently connected and also receive feed forward input. For a moment, let's, let's not plot the I'm not going to plot the recurrent connections I'm only going to plot the excitatory uh, sorry the, the feed forward connections to the excitatory and to the inhibitory neurons and so what you will see is that very beautifully the tuning curves for both the excitatory and inhibitory neurons uh, so these are the feed forward inputs into these into the, the, the feed forward weights into these neurons end up beautifully uh, distributing themselves and spanning the entire space. So we no longer have the clustering of the excitatory neurons, and that is aided by, uh, by the inhibitory neurons. This is, of course, subject to the fact that we have satisfied this condition that involves the number of neurons um, and the weight norms. So we develop an intuition for the linear network, but we can explain what happens also in the nonlinear network. So we can go beyond and think about what this means for the recurrent connections. So let's actually look at the recurrent connections in this network. I'm not showing you how they develop in time, but we can look at the uh, final uh, steady state. In this, in this connectivity matrix, we can cluster the neurons according to <coughs> tuning preference. And so we see that they really line up along the diagonal, meaning that neurons 
that are uh, similarly tuned are more strongly connected uh, to each other. And of course, this is with, in agreement with a lot of experimental data from different uh, centers. <coughs> so basically, like connects to like also in the recurrent network. And just as a side note, we don't we don't just look at connectivity. One can look at activity. So, for instance, if we plot the response tuning curves that are all centered around the preferred uh, uh, tuning orientation, and if we average for excitation inhibition, we actually see that in our networks, um, inhibition is a little bit broader than excitation, which agrees with experimental data from different sensory cortices. And we can also look at the conductances of excitation inhibition. And again, we see that in inhibition is slightly more broadly tuned than excitation, which again agrees with a lot of experimental data uh, from different uh, cortices. Okay, so, so, so far I have shown you that we can learn the weights in a way, in a fully recurrent network, in a way that can basically decorrelate these tuning curves. But can we do computations? I motivated all of this by telling you that we have these very nice, uh, uh, powerful, biologically inspired networks such as the SSN that can do a lot of computations. So let's see, have we actually managed to learn something like the SSN? So we basically look at what the final uh, steady state of the network, so network in, in a steady state that we have uh, learned can actually do. And indeed, um, our networks can do response normalization, just like uh, experiments and just like the static SSN that I showed you at the very beginning. So we can show two stimuli um, in, in equal magnitude shown here in the orange and in the green. And then when we combine them, we see that the network sublinearly effectively uh, sums the response of this combined stimulus. And when we basically reduce the amplitude of one of these stimuli, we see that the network does winner take all like computation. So it preserves uh, the response to the stronger stimulus, but it suppresses the response to the weaker stimulus. And something that I don't have time, a lot of time to go into detail, um, you know, it's another kind of dynamical effect in these networks. Um, and that is known <clears throat> as the paradoxical effect. So what happens our network because of this, uh, the presence of the nonlinearity and the properties of recurrent connectivity um, can actually enter the regime of inhibitory stabilization. So what does that mean? That means that if we provide the network with inhibitory input, um, that's shown so we can increase the inhibitory input into the network, uh, that's shown on the x-axis, one would imagine that, of course, when you drive a population, in this case, the inhibitory population, you expect its response to increase. But that's not what happens. In fact, and this, this agrees with, with um, uh, data as well, what we actually see is that the response of the inhibitory population decreases. And the reason for this is that the network enters the state where inhibition is really necessary to basically stabilize the dynamics so that even though you drive inhibition, as transiently as inhibition increases, it tends to suppress um, excitation, which now withdraws excitation recurrently from inhibition and therefore further suppresses um, inhibition. So you see this paradoxical effect where even though you drive inhibition, inhibition ends up, uh, the inhibitory population ends up decreasing its firing rate. So the increase only happens once you completely, once you drive inhibition so much that you completely shut off excitation. So again, this, is, this has been studied in a lot of theoretical and, and then uh, found in experimental work as well. And this is a, a phenomenon that we can also capture in our networks that learn uh, the connections uh, with heavy and plasticity. Um, so indeed, we are able to achieve this purely by, by learning the synaptic connections from the raw stimulus statistics. Um, but what is uh, what our networks also seem to do is not just capture all these computations that the, S the static SSN can do, but they actually reveal some new insights to us. And this is very much work in progress and would love to hear some feedback on this. So um, it seems like as, as this learning occurs, um, the, the network gain, so the gain of the network seems to change. And this effectively changes this decorrelation of the tuning curves that I showed you a moment ago. So we actually have scenarios where we, so we have the correlation, but at the same time, we also have partial collapsing of the tuning curves, which is, which is what we try to sort of prevent. So here we find the particular parameter regime where we can sort of change the norms and the numbers of neurons in our circuits. And what we see, I'm going to run this again, we begin with many neurons, they're randomly uh, distributed. And what we see over time is that they, they sort of decorrelate, they sort of fill in input space, 
but they also cluster. So we sort of end up ha having tuning curves that become clustered and decorrelated at the same time. And I should really stress that this clustering does not occur because we have clustering in the input. The input is purely homogeneous or it's, uh, it's uniform across space. It occurs because of uh, uh, the development of connectivity in the network. So, you know, this is, we're st still trying to understand what goes on, but we think what goes on is that you effectively change where you are um, in the gain, in the network gain of the system. Um, so that's why you can be simultaneously decorrelating and non-decorrelating or sort of collapsing at the same time. So <clears throat> we can, if we present the network with a stimulus, that is where the orientation lies basically between uh, the two peaks, peaks of two tuning curves, uh, then the neurons are uh, somewhat weakly active. So this basically corresponds to linearizing our network around a fixed point where the gain of the network is low. And so in this case, we think that the condition for the correlation uh, that we derived for the linear network is fulfilled. And that's why we effectively get uh, well, these tuning curves don't merge, at least at this point. But then if we consider a scenario where now we stimulate uh, the neurons at the peak of the tuning curves, this is a high gain regime. So if we do the linearization here, uh, we see that the, the condition that we derived for decorrelation is not satisfied. And therefore we see a, a partial collapse of the tuning curves. So depending on the gain, we get these different regimes that either lead to decorrelation or to uh, collapse of the tuning curves. Now, is this relevant biologically? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, one example where this occurs might be the perception of hues, where it has been found that a similar configuration of tuning curves can indeed lead to this categorical perception of colors. So here, for example, the response of the population vector to different hues becomes clustered in a very similar way to what we saw before, so that similar hues can actually be grouped or classified as a specific color. And this is not just characteristic for hues, it's also been seen for the categorization of phonemes in auditory uh, system. And in general, we think maybe it's a relevant property for categorical perception that can be explained by a model. And I'm going to end, I think I'm a few minutes late, but I just want to summarize what I've shown you before. Our ultimate goal was to learn uh, the SSN, so the stabilized superlinear network which has all these cool computational properties. Um, and we did this effectively by building the model from the ground up. So first we considered how at the level of a single postsynaptic neuron, uh, this neuron can effectively tune its excited tune inhibitory input in a way that, that is balanced. So we proposed the Hebbian learning rule with normalization for excitation and inhibition. Then we considered a recurrent network <clears throat> where we derived conditions for when the tuning curves would decorrelate. And we found that uh, this depends on the normalization uh, constants, so the norms on the weights, as well as the numbers of neurons. Uh, we can not only decorrelate these feedforward inputs, but we also see uh, the emergence of, of uh, this like-to-like -like connectivity also in the recurrent connectivity in the network. And importantly, we derive these networks that can actually implement a wide variety of computations as sort of common for the SSN, such as this response normalization. So we have achieved, uh, indeed, uh, we, we have succeeded. It's, it's still still trying to understand the details, but we have achieved in learning this, this SSN. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we, we think that this is uh, interesting in terms of um, understanding how these connections develop to give rise to these networks that can perform these interesting computations. Okay, so SSN, but now with plasticity. And so I will like to end with thanking my entire group, but especially Sam Ekman, who really uh, was uh, spearheading all of this work that I presented today. We are hoping to have a preprint soon, uh, but I really look forward to feedback and thank you for the attention.